So we're going to try to tie together system performance with cache performance. So remember we talked about metrics for cache performance, specifically uh, AMAT average memory access time, and that's the hit time plus the miss rate times the miss penalty. We can formulate a recursive miss penalty, and, and this is just the hit time at the next level plus the miss rate at the next level multiplied by the miss penalty from the next level. And the hit time, sometimes it's called the access time. So the hit time or access time is how long it takes you to get to that level, check if you have a hit, and get that data back. And some cache organizations allow you to check the hit in parallel to the data back. I have nothing else to say here except that AMAT is not a measure of the computer system performance. It's solely looking at the memory. Okay. So now let's talk about how all of this feeds into processor metrics for performance. So here is our iron law. Performance is measured in terms of the amount of time it takes for a program. And we break this down into the uh, instruction count, the CPI, and the clock cycle time. And uh, cache affects the clock cycle time. So the hit time, especially. Uh, is important for the clock cycle time because think about your five stage pipeline and replace the idea of instruction memory and data memory with instruction cache and data cache. Hit time to memory is a critical path through that stage of the pipeline. Um, you want to reduce that hit latency for the L1 cache. So the L1 cache hit latency is super duper important because it affects the clock cycle time. Your L1 cache, you optimize the hit time so that you can keep the clock cycle time of the processor low. The L2 cache, you're going to optimize your miss rate because you want to avoid paying the steep, steep penalty of going out to memory because cache misses affect the number of cycles that each instruction takes. So your miss rate and miss penalty influence CPI and your hit time influences cycle time. So breaking apart the CPI into how many cycles an instruction requires when it's a hit and how many when it's a miss. This affects all instructions because the instruction cache can hit and miss. Usually the instruction cache hit rate or miss penalty is applied uniformly as a multiplier over the instruction count. And the data cache misses will apply only to the CPI of instructions that access the data cache. So loads and stores. So we've got our hit time, so hit cycles per instruction, plus our cycles per miss multiplied by our miss rate, misses per instruction. You'll often see miss rate specified as a, a fraction or a percent of misses per instruction. And that's our, our miss penalty, right? Cycles per miss is our miss penalty and misses per instruction is our miss rate. So this is looking very similar to AMAT. So now we can look at our uh, recursive definition where we have multiple levels of cache, then our miss penalty becomes a product summation, well, a, sum, a summation of the products of the miss penalty and the miss rate for each level of cache, because each level of cache has its own miss rates and has a different miss penalty, typically exponentially increasing miss penalties as you go farther down the cache hierarchy. If the miss rate is given to you as a misses per instruction, then that's pretty easy to incorporate directly into this sort of plug and chuck formula. If your miss rate is given as memory access references, then you need to know how many references there are per instruction. So you need to know the instruction mix, loads per program, stores per program. Then you need to break that down further into misses per load, misses per store. I got a nasty equation coming up in a couple slides to help you with that. These analytical sort of formulations are grossly simplifying actual processor performance. In the very, dare I say, simple pipeline that we've been looking at so far, these, these equations can hold to the extent that we're able to accurately measure or estimate the parameters of these equations. The miss rate is a property of the cache configuration and of the program. And so that's a, a variable without necessarily a ground truth. In more advanced processor designs, you can no longer analytically describe or calculate or predict these performance numbers 
by equation because when you can overlap the miss penalty with useful work, then you basically hide that miss penalty. So if store misses, if you have store buffers that can hide store misses and the store buffers are never full, then you never see a store miss penalty. On the other hand, if it's full some amount of the time, you see the miss penalty, but only that amount of the time. It adds another variable. And the more complexity there is in the processor to hide these penalties, the harder it gets to model and formulate these processor equations. Just to let you know, I'll teach you how to do this. In reality, in modern processors, the only way to really get these kinds of performance numbers is to run programs, representative workloads through a accurate simulator that, that simulates all of this kind of behavior and gives you out the end a number for your cycle count or for your time. Now we're going to talk about how DRAM memory works and about how you calculate miss penalty for memory so that you get a feel for where that miss penalty number comes from. Uh, on the top here, we have this kind of uh, cube, which is a representation of DRAM, uh, dynamic random access memory. DRAM is organized as this uh, 2D array, n rows, and we've got n columns. So we've got an n by n array. Each of these rows and columns is a is what's called a bit plane. And so we've got these these m bit planes. So the 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 bit plane is m bits wide. So when you want to load from a, an address, you want to read a value. You send the address to the memory. Well, the uh, memory controller actually transforms that flat memory address, right? Your memory address is a, a number between 0 and 2 to the n minus 1 for a n bit address space. The memory controller actually transforms that into a two-dimensional row index and a column index to specify where the byte that you want is located in that three-dimensional space. The the bit plane, the m-bit plane, is the, the bytes that you read. You take the column and the row, send the row address in, and activate the row. It drops this row down into this bottom little n by m SRAM you see at the bottom there. That's a static RAM. Remember, implementation of storage using cross-coupled inverters is like a big register file. Well, it's a big memory, right? It's only big enough to hold a single row. This is called a row buffer. Once you've got the row that you want down in the row buffer, then the column address is used to march through that row from left to right reading out the m bit planes until you have enough data that you need. The DRAM in general, the memory hardware controller is going to take that row buffer and write it back up into the 3D DRAM array up on top. The reason this is done this way is because SRAM is fast to read and write. The technology of the DRAM uses capacitor with a transistor to store each bit. So each bit is, uh, its charge is stored in a capacitor. A uh, capacitor is like a little battery, a little rechargeable battery. And that transistor is used to uh, determine whether the capacitor discharges its load onto a wire or accepts a, a load from the wire or not. OK, so it, it opens up, kind of opens up the floodgate, if you will, between wires of the memory and the capacitor so that you can read and write the value in the capacitor. Now, those wires just connect down to the row buffer at the bottom. A uh, capacitor slowly loses its charge, just like a battery slowly loses its charge. If your battery is um, plugged in, even if it's not on, it's always losing some leakage from the positive to negative terminal. Well, the same is true for capacitors. They slowly lose their charge. They get they get drained. There's also this, this notion of refreshing. You may have heard of um, DRAM refreshing. That's just reading out a row and then writing it back in again. So it, it recharges the capacitors, it's preserving uh, high and low values of capacitors. So that's how DRAM works in, in a nutshell. I'm sure there's probably a, a reasonable description of this. Wikipedia probably has something not too bad. This is all pretty common old knowledge. The, the important points here, though, is that each time that you want to access a byte 
of memory, you've got three things going on. The row buffer access, and then you've got the column access, and then you've got each of those bit planes that you access. You can see on the bottom, we've got this kind of timeline. So we've got this RAS, that means a row address strobe. That's just a fancy way of saying access that row. And then we've got CAS, that's column address strobe. That's just, again, access that column. So the row address strobe is uh, where the row that you want is being requested to drop down into that row buffer. But the memory controller only does the row address strobe after it's already written out another row that's in the row buffer back up into the larger DRAM array. So that takes time to drop that row down into the row buffer if it's not already there. And then the column address strobe, that's going to take the column that you want to access the first chunk of data that you want. And then each additional chunk of data, the, the important takeaways here are that each time you access a, a different row, there's an overhead to drop down that row into the row buffer. Sequential accesses of columns within the same row is much cheaper, relatively cheaper, because you don't have to change the row in the row buffer, you're just accessing them from the SRAM, which is fast. So now we're gonna talk about what the implications are of this technology on the bus and then on the computer system performance. So the, uh, the way that the cache and memory communicate can, can greatly affect how well the computer system performs. Let's take a look at a one word wide bus. We're assuming a, a four byte word, so 32 bit wide bus, a one word wide memory. Okay, we got to send an address to the memory. Let's assume that takes one memory bus clock cycle. Memory bus operates at a different frequency than the CPU does. It's normally harmonic with the CPU frequency. The memory bus clock cycle is usually a multiple of the CPU clock cycle. Vis a vis the memory bus frequency is normally, uh, it normally divides the CPU frequency, divides evenly. Now let's assume it takes one memory bus clock cycle to send the address that you want to the processor. We're going to assume for now a load. Stores work basically the same way. Our other assumption is that it takes 15 bus clock cycles to get the first word in the block from the DRAM. The measurement of that would come from how long it takes to access a new row. And then we'll assume for the sake of argument that it takes five bus clock cycles for the second, third, and fourth words that would be the columns that you access, right? So the columns access time is much less than the new row access time. And then we'll assume it takes one bus clock cycle to return a word of data. 32-bit wide bus means you got 32 data wires connected from the cache to the memory system. So each of those wires can carry one bit, one signal in one clock cycle. Over all 32 of those wires, you can transfer 32 bits each clock cycle. The memory bus to the cache bandwidth is how many bytes you can get from memory and transfer to the processor or really to the cache each memory bus clock cycle. If the cache block is one word, then a memory access on a cache miss will stall the pipeline until you get that word back from memory. How long does that take? So one memory bus clock cycle to send the address, that's what we just said. 15 bus cycles to access a new row and get that data. And we're only getting one word from that row. So that's all the data we want, and it takes us one bus clock cycle to return that data because we can return 32 bits per bus clock cycle. So this is a 17 bus clock cycle miss penalty. We, we don't know how many CPU clock cycles that would be because we don't know the multiplier for the clock cycle time. Bandwidth, then, is how many bytes are transferred per bus clock cycle. That's four bytes transferred in 17 clock cycles. So we're getting an effective bandwidth of 0.235 bytes per memory bus clock cycle, which is, which is not great considering that the bus clock cycle could be as much as one byte per bus clock cycle. Pretty innovative efficient here. The inefficiency is really coming in that middle there part there, right? 15 bus clock cycles to read the DRAM. How can we do better? Well, one way to improve your throughput is to do more work, as long as you can do more work in incrementally less time. Let's take this example. If the block size is four words and each word is in a different DRAM row, what would that look like? Well, it would take us one cycle to send the, the address that we want, and then we would send the next address that we want, and that would overlap with uh, accessing of the DRAM. Each of those four words in four different rows means we have four different row activations. Each new row takes 15 cycles. Here in orange, we've got our sending of the address, and then we've got 15 cycles to read 
one row, one word from one row. We'll return that word to the processor while we are also accessing the next word. So one cycle to send the first address, 15 cycles for each row access overlaps with the time it takes us to send the address for the next word we want and to return the value of the word that we're getting. So that's why the orange and blue there are overlapping and why on the equation we don't include all of those orange and blue parts. So we've got one cycle to send the first address. We've got four chunks of 15 cycles for reading the DRAM. And then we've got one cycle at the end to return the last word, which doesn't overlap with any other work that we're doing with respect to this miss. So that's a total of 62 clock cycles. This is really quite bad. Bandwidth here, now we're transferring four words. So four words times four bytes per word is 16 divided by 62. That's 0.258 bytes per clock cycle. So that's better than it was, right? 0.235 before, 0.258 now. Hooray! Increasing the amount of work we do, we were able to overlap some of the overhead. Some of the time spent is overlapping there. And so that's why our throughput goes up, because it doesn't take us four times as long to transfer four times as much data. But we can do better by not having all of those words in different rows. If all four of our words of our cache block are in the same row of the DRAM, I will, I will talk about it right now real quickly. If all four of our words are in the same row, then our overhead would be one cycle to send the first address, 15 cycles to access the first row, and then five additional cycles for each additional word, and then one cycle to return the last data word. That would be one plus 15 plus three times five plus one. So that's one plus 15 plus 15 plus one. That would be 32 clock cycles. So then our, our bandwidth would be 16 over 32, what, 0.5. Well, that, I can do that in my head, so that's great. So if we put all of the words in the same DRAM row, then our, our bandwidth would be 0.5. And then there's this um, memory system optimization called interleaving or banking memory. So you divide your memory into banks, which are all, they can operate independently in parallel. If you look at a, at a DRAM chip, it's got actually multiple chips on it, right? It's got multiple little black chips on it that you can see. And we partition the, the addresses of the system across these banks. We actually stripe the addresses over these banks. If we have four uh, banks, then will allocate, say, uh, word zero to bank zero, word one to bank one, word two to bank two, word three to bank three, word four to bank zero, five to one. So we use that kind of a modulo arithmetic to allocate words that are next to each other into banks that are next to each other. This way, we can access multiple words that are next to each other simultaneously because they're in separate banks and each of those banks has its own independent hardware. It's got its own array of DRAM cells. It's got its own row buffer. So here we've got more hardware. So we have overhead in the hardware. We'll see that that improves our performance quite a lot. In this example, for a block size of four words again, if we have interleaved memory where we do exactly what I said and we put different words in different banks, and they're all next to each other in memory, which is right for a cache block. All the words come right next to each other. Then it takes one cycle to send the address, and then it takes 15 cycles to read all of the banks in parallel. And then we have to return the data serially over the bus because we can't send more than 32 bits at a time over the bus. So it would take us four cycles to return the data words on the bus, which will give you a 20 clock cycle miss penalty for this example, which would give us a bandwidth of 16 over 20, which is 0.8. The next kind of logical improvement from this would be widening our bus, since we now have an opportunity to want to return more data than we have um, available. So if our bus size is, uh, if we make our bus size equal to our block size, then we can return a block in one bus cycle. So if our bus in this example was 96 bits wide, we could return all four of those words in one cycle. But then we would have four times as many wires in our computer. So that would be the price we would be paying. So we have a trade-off between how much hardware we're willing to put in our 
computer versus how much more throughput we can squeeze out of it. So that's how the memory system works and why the memory characteristics are important to be matched to the cache block, especially the last level cache. So going back to our iron law and breaking this down further, we'll, we'll assume that hits are normal, are, are included in our normal CPI. Iron law is our instruction count times our CPI times our clock cycle time. So that's our instruction count times um, this quantity here, CPI ideal. Our ideal case is that we hit. That's our CPI with hits plus our memory stall cycles multiplied by our clock cycle time. That uh, CPI ideal plus our memory stall cycles, sometimes we'll call that CPI stall. So that's our CPI when we include stalling. We have memory stall cycles that come from our cache misses. And again, we can break this down into read stalls and write stalls. Read stalls, we always have to wait for read misses. We can't hide them um, to some extent, at least for our current pipelining. So that's our how many reads you have in a program multiplied by their miss rate, multiplied by the read miss penalty, which may or may not be the same thing as a write miss penalty. Write stall cycles is how many writes we have multiplied by our write miss penalty, multiplied by write buffer stalls. The write through caches, we have memory stall cycles are uniform. Reads and write misses are kind of identical. So accesses per program times the miss rate times the miss penalty. Broken down for write back caches, there we go. So if you have a write back cache with a write buffer, then your stall cycles are equal to your cache misses multiplied by your cache miss rate multiplied by how often you have a dirty line multiplied by how often your write buffer is full. That first term there, that's your write back penalty. So how much it costs you to do a cache eviction, a cache write back. You only have to write back if it's a dirty line and there was a miss to replace it and the write buffer is full, then you got to wait for it. Plus your cache access is multiplied by your cache miss rate. That's simply fetching your miss data. And so that interior term there that gives you an overall cache miss rate for evictions where your write buffer is full and then for cache misses that have to fetch a block. And then you multiply that by your miss penalty. Write back cache cycles. If you don't have a write buffer, then you get rid of the write buffer full rate. You basically substitute one for write buffer full rate. So you've got cache accesses multiplied by the cache miss rate multiplied by the dirty rate added to the cache accesses multiplied by the cache miss rate. All that multiplied by the miss penalty. And through some algebra, you can simplify that to this last line here. Cache accesses by cache miss rate by dirty rate plus one multiplied by miss penalty. Those are some equations that I put together to help solve some problems that I like to ask in homework assignments. Write through cache equations are given here, depending on whether you have a write allocate or write no allocate scheme. So if you have a write allocate scheme, you have to pay for fetching. So you've got your cache accesses multiplied by your cache miss rate. That's your, your normal sort of miss rate. And then you've got write accesses multiplied by your write hit rate times your write buffer full rate. That's when you have to wait or stall for a write miss when your write buffer is full. So you've got those two components of write miss rates and you multiply that by a miss penalty. We'll assume here a read and write miss penalty is identical. It's pretty much normal. And then a write no allocate. If you have write no allocate, you don't fetch on a write miss. So you separate out reads and writes. So your read access is multiplied by your read miss rate is one portion of your miss penalty. And then your write access is are only a problem when you have a write buffer full. Here is a plug and chug of an example. I can walk through this and relate this example back to the equations on the previous slides to see how you calculate the processor performance. But through sort of that plug and chug, we get that the cycles per instruction when we include memory stalls is 5.44, opposed to a, an ideal CPI of two. We've talked about multi-level caches before. While well, you can plug and chug with multi-level caches by recursively formulating your miss penalties as additive terms. Overall, we've talked a lot about cache in a short amount of time. We've talked about different ways to do cache optimization. So reduce your hit time by having smaller caches, having direct map caches. And there's something called way prediction, which we didn't really talk about, but you predict which way is going to be a hit. If you're wrong, you pay a little, but if you're right, great. Having smaller blocks reduces your hit time, but then it increases your miss rate. And so is smaller cache. There's always a trade-off. Reducing the miss rate, we talked about different ways of doing that. And again, if you reduce the miss rate, you might increase the hit time or the miss penalty. And then different optimizations for reducing the miss penalty are listed here as well. The cache stalls and when they have to stall and then how long it takes you to go out to memory. And then you can improve your memory technology to also reduce your miss penalty. 
So that was fun.